introduce the moderator for the next panel. And this panel I'm, I'm really very excited about because uh, it's an area that we have not addressed that much, in, at least in recent years. And I really think when we start looking at our theme of this conference of uh, battlefields, uh, war rooms, backyards, this really has to do with almost all of those things in a lot of ways. Because uh, we know more and more about the impact of maritime issues on global commerce, on the battlefield. Probably one of the, the most controversial areas in the world right now is the South China Sea, and I think uh, one of our panelists might address that. So uh, our, our moderator is uh, Professor George Walker from uh, Wake Forest University Law School. I've, I've known George for many years. He's, he's one of the deans of the Admiralty Law area, not just at Wake Forest, but really in, on a national level. And again, this is someone who is a mentor to me many years ago. Uh, we met up at the Naval War College, and it's, it's great to have you here, George. Please. I think you and I share a common uh, mentor, uh, Jim Taylor, uh, the late Jim Taylor, good friend of mine, mentor, mentor of yours, and mentor of mine. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, I want to express my thanks first to the uh, Duke Law School and second to the center uh, for having me here and I think for sponsoring this panel. Uh, we have a distinguished panel to discuss uh, sea business, issues in maritime security law. Let me first uh, say a little bit about maritime security law in the geographic area. Oceans cover about three quarters of the world's surface. Uh, it, uh, the, you have, of course, the airspace above it, uh, outer space above that, and of course our submarines and those of many other countries travel below the ocean surface. Naval warfare, uh, as a component of maritime security, uh, covers not only that, but also possibly riverine warfare, if you remember uh, Vietnam or the War of 1812, the Great Lakes, where we won the only single battle I think uh, the U.S. Navy had in that war. I could be corrected. Uh, and today, of course, aircraft, uh, unmanned vehicles, missiles, conven conventional uh, gunfire uh, are all part of naval warfare. More than that, uh, it uh, includes multinational operations. Our recent CNO talked about the idea of the thousand ship Navy, and we don't have a thousand ships in the U.S. Navy anymore. And he was talking about multilateral uh, operations, both under uh, collective self-defense agreements like NATO, but also what might be called, I've called informal self-defense or coalition warfare, which seems to be the rule of the day. It includes also uh, things like uh, actions under the Security Council, uh, resolutions as we've seen, and uh, it may include, of course, self-defense issues as well. Maritime security law uh, may, but doesn't always include, the law of sea issues like anti-piracy operations, and we have an expert on that with us today. It may or may not affect that rights and admiralty, that is, for the private practitioners out here. Uh, things like the war clause, war risk insurance, uh, uh, impossibility of performance, carriage of goods by sea, charters, all of those can be impacted by maritime security issues and decision by national decision makers. And it can involve, even today, prize law, piracy, diversion of merchant shipping, naval control of shipping, uh, and, and the like. Well, we have, from this huge potpourri, uh, we have three topics today and three experts. I'm delighted to chair the panel. Uh, after their prepared remarks, we'll throw open uh, the discussion for your questions. Uh, first of all, our, let me introduce the speakers, and then I will uh, turn the podium or the table over to the first speaker, Vice Admiral James Hawk, recently retired Judge Advocate General of the Navy, and now on the Penn State University Dickinson School of Law faculty. As a distinguished scholar, will address the law of the sea in the South China dispute. Commander James Kroska, JAG Corps U.S. Navy, and Howard Levy, Chair of International Law at the Naval War College, uh, will discuss piracy and high seas crimes. And then finally, Captain Glenn Silmazy, U.S. Coast Guard Professor of Law at the Coast Guard Academy, New London, who will discuss port security and related issues. 
And after that, we'll have, throw the floor open for questions, and I uh, hope to answer them. Admiral, the floor is yours. And I hope this is going to work. Yes. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, I wasn't expecting to see that, but. <laughs> The, uh, thank you, uh, George and uh, General Dunlap and, and Duke for hosting this spectacular event. It's a real honor to be invited back uh, to talk for a few minutes about what Harold Coe has, has called the most important, least understood international law issue of our time. So you're very privileged because we're going to figure it out in 15 minutes. Uh, what I hope to do is not untangle anything, but to just give you a few facts to at least you, to allow you to better understand the entanglement, and then pose a couple of questions. What role law will have in, this, uh, in the resolution of these disputes, and what role the United States might play constructively in this as well, okay? Um, first, let me say a few words about what I am not going to talk about because in 15 minutes it's absolutely impossible to deal comprehensively with the complexities in the Western Pacific. And I'm deliberately using the term Western Pacific as opposed to tying it to any particular nation state in the region. Uh, on the lower right, circled in yellow, are, and I hope that you can see this, high resolution graphics of the area are surprisingly difficult to find uh, that are useful for a presentation like this, but these Spratly Islands, uh, are to give you a sense of the, the dynamics here, are claimed either in whole or in part by six different countries. Uh, China and Taiwan together, and it's very interesting the commonality of interests that China and Taiwan have when we get into this field to talk about this. Uh, China and Taiwan claim all of the Spratleys as do Vietnam, uh, and Malaysia, Brunei, and the Philippines all claim part of them. <laughs> Uh, there are 45 islands that are occupied by one of those countries. Uh, there are about 750 rocks and shoals and reefs that are in the region, so you're, you're getting the picture here. Uh, it's also an especially difficult day when you sit down with your negotiating partner and your negotiating partner says, let's go back and start in the year 1271 in the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, which is precisely where China begins its discussion of the Spratly Islands. Um, a somewhat easier problem to the northwest are the Paracel Islands, uh, a much more recent claim from China beginning there in the 1300s, and, and then uh, also claimed by uh, Vietnam and, and Taiwan as well. Uh, not going to talk about that, not going to talk about South Korea and Japan's disagreements. But what I want to do, do want to talk about are two things that have been in the news. Uh, two things that have much in common but are going in very different directions. Uh, that being the dispute between China and Japan over uh, islands uh, relatively equidistant from both of them. Uh, and then secondly, to talk about the dispute between China and the Philippines. Uh, on something called the Scarborough Shoal. Back up, sister. There we go. Uh, as you can hopefully see, uh, these islands, uh, the first set of islands, the uh, Senkaku by Japan, Diaoyu by China, uh, are located about 200 miles east of China, about 240 miles southwest of Okinawa, and uh, they've been in the news lately uh, for the way that military activity has begun to bubble around these islands. Um, in January of 2013, we had Japan alleging that China had penetrated the airspace of these islands, so Japan scrambled fighters. Uh, a few weeks later, we had Japan alleging that China had locked on to Japanese uh, ships with fire control radar. Uh, just last week, we had reports of China depositing buoys in the water around these islands. So, uh, so far it's stayed uh, manageable, but of course when people begin to do these things, there's always the, the opportunity for inadvertent slips. Um, heretofore, and heretofore being up until about 1970, uh, the main claim to fame of these islands, there are eight of them, with a total of about, about four square miles. That's not a mistake, four square miles, eight islands. 
uh, that's generating all this interest. And uh, in the 1800s, uh, China's main use for the islands was to get some medicinal herbs. In this century, Japan's main use for the islands has been to lease them to a private businessman who's used them to, to get feathers and guano for, for business. Uh, that began to change in, in 1970. A UN commission came out and, and talked about, for the first time really, talked about the fact that there may be billions of gallons of oil in the vicinity of these islands and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas near the islands, and the dynamic changed. Uh, China in 1971 said that these have always been part of China, and then in 1972, the U.S. gave them back to Japan as part of the, uh, the wind down from World War II. Uh, today, uh, very, very superficially, the, the claims of the islands are, Japan says that this was no man's land, terra nullius, and in 1895 uh, annexed these islands and have exercised a degree of sovereignty over them uh, ever since. China makes some historical arguments of its own, uh, says that these were part of Taiwan and that the Japan illegally seized Taiwan in 1895 as part of the Russian-Japanese War and it was supposed to give these back when it gave Taiwan back after World War II and never did. So you, you see the sort of the depth and the complexity of their respective arguments summarized here in about 20 seconds. Uh, there are papers and books that have been written in great depth on this. Um, at the risk of oversimplifying, what one might give a slight edge to Japan and underscore at the risk of oversimplifying. And these are, are not clear, uh, but at least in modern times, Japan may have the better edge of it here because they have had uh, Japanese businessmen on the islands and they've collected taxes from them and they've done fisheries patrol in the area. But it's, it's at this point not clear enough that we don't have this dispute that we're facing. Uh, the second area is cir circled there in the red uh, and it's called the Scarborough Reef and that's named after an English guy who ran aground there uh, a long time ago. The, the Chinese and the Philippines each have their own respective national names for this area. Uh, this reef is 115 miles west of the Philippines about 170 miles east of a set of islands that China claims. And it's, it's much bigger than the Sakaku Diaoyu Island set. It's about 100 square miles. Uh, and it basically consists of some rocks and arguably, uh, and I use rock in a loose non-technical term, that uh, are above the surface of the water. Um, and that's what we're fighting about there. There are uh, significant fishing grounds in the area, which are important, very important to the local economies. And once again, it's what lies beneath that is more the source of controversy in terms of gas and oil and, and mineral rights that may flow from uh, these topographical situations. Uh, and there you get some sense of, of what we're talking about and people planting flags on top of them and, and it you would, you would be mistaken to, to allow the sort of ap apparent silliness of these images to mask the seriousness as if dispute to both countries because they, they take it very seriously. Uh, China uh, has made uh, a claim to these islands uh, as part of another island group since about the 1930s in, in a very explicit and, and direct way. Uh, and also, though, includes it within the mysterious nine dash line, uh, which you get a sense for here. Uh, the area in green is something that China declared in, in the late 1940s to the United Nations and then has been re repeatedly reaffirming it over the past decades as area that is China's sovereign territory. The, the difficulty is nobody quite knows exactly what that means. Uh, and China has been arguably deliberately vague about it because it allows them to remain kind of a moving target in terms of legal analysis, but also to satisfy nationalist demands within their own country that they are asserting this sovereignty. Uh, the Philippines says about the Scarborough Reef is that it is within the Philippine exclusive economic zone. 
uh, and that it is uh, a commonsensical, common sense to anybody that these islands and this reef so close to the Philippines ought to belong to the Philippines. Uh, and so there we are. Uh, on 22nd of January of this year, the Philippines submitted this to arbitration uh, under the U UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And so that's the, the very brief scene setter of, of the, the problem that we've got in both of these areas. So I think the question that I, I want to just touch on very briefly here, the two questions, the first one being what role will the law play in this dispute? Uh, the, the Philippines really had reached wit's end, and they had tried within ASEAN and also bilaterally to reach some solutions with the Chinese, and that, that wasn't working ver out very well for them. So they submitted this to arbitration under the Law of the Sea Convention. China and the Philippines are both members of the convention. Uh, and in very brief terms, uh, both are bound by the terms of the convention to participate in arbitration with one significant caveat, which is that the Law of the Sea Convention allows uh, parties to uh, opt out if it involves a sovereignty dispute or a maritime boundary dispute. And that becomes the central issue in this arbitration is whether or not the arbitral tribunal, once it is appointed, will decide that it has jurisdiction over this dispute. Um, one commentator who, who follows these issues closely on, on one of the international law blogs has said that, that China's refusal to participate in the arbitration, which China has recently declared that it will not participate, uh, will deal a crushing and perhaps fatal blow to the United Nations Law of the Sea dispute resolution processes. I, I personally think that's a little overheated and a little overdrawn. Uh, I actually think that there are a number of scenarios here where the rule of law in some way gets affirmed by this process. The, the arbitral tribunal may find that it has no jurisdiction uh, and that China's claims are consistent with the, the Law of the Sea Convention. It might find that it has jurisdiction and rule for China. It might find that it has jurisdiction and rule for the Philippines. And China, in some subtle, face-saving way, might choose to acknowledge that in some way and work with the Philippines on that. There is a fourth possibility, which is probably the one that people are most focused on and perhaps the most ominous, which would be that the tribunal finds it has jurisdiction, rules against China, and China chooses to ignore it. Uh, in, in some superficial way bearing resemblance to our own experience in the Nicaragua case a few decades ago. So uh, hard to know where that one is going. Uh, it points out, though, the, the fundamental challenge with the Law of the Sea Convention in this area, that the Law of the Sea Convention is about the sea, and that these problems flow fundamentally from who owns the land. And the Law of the Sea Convention doesn't provide answers for who owns the land, and it also doesn't provide necessarily airtight answers to questions of what is an island and what is a rock, which are key definitional problems in these disputes. Uh, if we had more time, we could get into those fascinating topics about the definitions of rocks and islands, but uh, I just want to highlight the issue at this point. Um, meanwhile, back at the Senkaku Diaoyu location, uh, we have things going in a very different direction there. If, uh, with, with apologies to, to Charlie Dunlap, if we've got a version of lawfare going on with the Philippines and China, I'm not sure what the opposite of lawfare is, if there's a converse term, fair law, <laughs> fair, fair law, war suit, or something, which I think is really what China, who has got arguably the more powerful uh, kinetic position in the area, is arguably trying to change the facts to influence a potential legal uh, encounter later on uh, with Japan. Japan, for its purposes, is continuing to deny that there's even a dispute. Uh, Japan says our claim to sovereignty on these islands is so solid that in, in so many words, we, we don't even deign to acknowledge uh, what China is saying about these islands. Um, two situations that you would think the law would provide promising answers for. Uh, countries, all members of the same treaty, countries with a lot of reasons to work together and try to find solutions within the law. Uh, I think, though, that we should not have great expectations about what the law is going to provide in, in these situations. Number one, we've touched very briefly on some of the significant gaps that are in the law. 
uh, number one, and number two, uh, this, both of these issues, as are the others, are heavily laden with centuries of cultural baggage and politics and everything that goes with the disputes uh, in this area. What does it mean for the United States? Uh, I think today on Sequester Day, uh, it, it, it ought to go without saying that the United States does not want to see these things get hotter than they already are. Uh, if, if you had a really cold-eyed, realist view of a situation, you might think it'd be in our interest to watch China get involved in some scraps of its own. Uh, that doesn't last very, the logic of that, I think, doesn't last very long. Uh, we have treaties with both Japan and the Philippines that arguably uh, require us to defend them if they come into conflict with, conflict with a neighbor in a circumstance like this. And I don't think anybody's looking for that to happen at this point. Um, I think a positive thing that the United States might do in the circumstance is to join the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. That, that may seem like a counterintuitive conclusion based on, on what we've just said about the gaps in the law of the sea and the way that it, it may not provide answers in this particular situation. But I think the US joining the law of the sea convention could do a couple of things which would be at least marginally helpful uh, in the Western Pacific at this point. Uh, one would be that it would demonstrate a commitment to the peaceful settlement of disputes and the rule of law. Symbolic though it may be, it would be a reaffirmation of that on the part of still arguably the world's greatest maritime power. Uh, secondly, it would give us enhanced authority as a broker and as a mediator in the region. Uh, over and over again, states in the area plead with us, sometimes privately, sometimes publicly to join the Law of the Sea Convention. We are the only country that is a participant in these disputes that is not a member of the convention. Uh, and I, I believe that for reasons that we don't have time to talk about today, that the risk of the convention to the United States are, are very overdrawn and exaggerated. Uh, so in 15 minutes, there's your tutorial on the complexity of the Western Pacific. And uh, if you have questions when we get to that stage, we'll, we'll be happy to, to talk about that. Thanks very much. Professor Commander Trosco will now talk to us about the sim simple issue of piracy and, and deep and water crime. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Walker, uh, Admiral. Uh, Professor Dunlap and uh, Professor uh, Solmacy, uh, talk about the issue of private maritime security companies as an adjunct for shipboard security uh, in the Western Indian Ocean, primarily driven by the threat of Somali piracy. So there are a lot of issues, legal and political issues, that have arisen in the context of Somali piracy. And from the political side, there's issues of stability in Somalia, governance in Somalia, stabilization. On the legal side, there's, you may have been exposed to some of the issues with regard to prosecution of pirates, extradition. Uh, in other words, what does the dog do when the dog catches the car? Once you've got pirates, what do you do with them? This is a, an issue that really has bedeviled the United States and other countries since about 2005. So what has been the response uh, there's been three responses. The first, the initial response was the thought that we could solve the problem by introducing warships into the area, and that has proceeded uh, fairly successfully in, in that there are warships operating there from about two dozen countries, including the United States. So this was a process that ramped up slowly from about 2005 when Somali piracy displaced Asian piracy, Southeast Asian piracy, as the epicenter of the, uh, of the threat in, in the oceans. So from about 2005 to 2007, there were several coalitions operating in the area. And now the United States uh, operates a coalition, as well as NATO operates a coalition. And then the European Union has a separate coalition. And there's a process to deconflict all of these ships operating in the area to provide security for vessels transiting through this area. 
This is the Western Indian Ocean, so it's between two and a half and four million square miles, about twice the size of the United States, including Alaska, so it's an enormous area. And, the, and each year, Somali pirates have progressively operated farther and farther from shore, expanding the difficulty of, of interdicting pirates and protecting ships. What sort of ships are in this area? From a U.S. perspective, you might think that it's a backwater. In fact, it's not. This is uh, one of the, the key transit routes, the key sea lanes for the global economy. 95% of everything uh, in, in international trade travels by sea. So all of your flat screen TVs, uh, oil, 95% of this travels by sea. In fact, this whole project of globalization that has been unfolding for about 40 years with a 40 to 50 percent expansion in global trade is only made possible because of uh, maritime transit. So in this particular area, you can see that it connects Europe, markets in Europe, to producers in Asia. And because of this, uh, the Western Indian Ocean also includes traffic coming in and out of the Persian Gulf going to the United States or Europe, and also traffic feeding into the Suez Canal and uh, uh, the Strait of Bab el Mandeb. So it's on the order of importance with the Panama Canal or the Straits of Malacca. It's one of the top three or so pieces of global infrastructure, if you think about uh, importance to the global economy. So what have been the problems of pirates? They have captured more than 200 ships, and they <coughs> held hostage more than 4,000 seafarers over the past few years. And 35 or 40 of these seafarers have been murdered, a number of them have been tortured, and it's had uh, economic effects as well that have rippled out. The cost to the world economy is 13 to 15 billion dollars. And so it's not an insignificant problem how to deal with Somali pirates. The warships have attempted to suppress piracy through programs such as escorting vessels. The problem is that because the, the area is so fast that a, a commercial ship has to be within about 15 minutes of assistance in order to make an escort feasible. So you have a large number of ships going through the area, about 20,000 a year and you've got warships, and the warship has to be very close to be able to respond and disrupt a pirate attack. Because once the pirates are on board the ship, then it's a hostage situation, and the warship is not really a, an effective tool. So a warship that has a helicopter or that's uh, nearby can be an effective deterrent, but you just can't put enough warships in this area to really make a difference. And so the level of piracy actually did not decline all that much uh, when you introduced the, the warships. They're still operating there. So they've had some uh, positive effect, but it's not been dispositive. It's not been noticeable. The second uh, approach developed in about 2006 or 2007 when the commercial ships began to realize they, at first they sort of had the attitude that, hey, we pay taxes. Uh, we expect the Navy, the navies of the world to ensure the, sea, the security of the sea lanes and therefore it's their responsibility. It's sort of analogous to saying I'm not going to buy a gun because that's what I pay taxes for. The police are supposed to protect me. Uh, because that has not been as effective as everybody has wanted, the industry adopted best management practices which include a range of passive and active measures to deter and defeat pirates once they uh, get into the, the area. So it can be anything from uh, uh, operating lights at night to being able to see where the pirates are, uh, dangling 55, empty 55 gallon drums over the side of the ship in order to deter boarding because the pirates don't have a, a, a advanced method of getting on board the ship. They're climbing on board with a, a gun in their, in their pants and a knife in their teeth, just like in the movies. Uh, and they're doing this, from, a, they're doing this from, from small boats, from skiffs. They're going at very high speeds, trying to, 
trying to board vessels, many of which are going at high speeds, even 10 or 12 knots is fairly significant. Try to jump on board a car, you know, from a bicycle. It's that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, scenario. So these measures have, had actually been more successful in many ways than warships. And they also didn't pose the other difficult legal issues that are still largely unresolved. What does the dog do when the dog catches the car? It's better just not to catch the car. It's just better to drive away from the, from the threat. And so through a series of these best management practices, uh, including things, other things like concertina wire, barbed wire around the, the lifelines of the ship, all of these have had some uh, benefit. But the piracy problem has still persisted. So really, what has been most effective is private maritime security companies. And what they do is they place armed, privately contracted, armed security on board ships. And there's a large number of companies that now have been uh, popping up in London and the United States and Dubai and other countries that are providing mostly ex-military persons in small teams to provide security for uh, international shipping going through the area. This has been actually fairly dramatically successful. The, the incidence of piracy has plummeted by about 75% over the past 18 months or so. So in, just to give you one figure, two years ago, there were 31 ships being held by Somali pirates. And so this is their kidnapping for ransom model. And once they take the vessel, there ensues then the process of negotiation. And the ransoms have been going up. They began at about $50,000. And then they quickly expanded from that up to a million. And now they're over three or four million dollars. And some ransoms have been 10 to 12 million dollars. Because Somali pirates realize that uh, international shipping companies and, and the countries from which these people come from value the lives of the seafarers on board the ship. And so they've, they've increased uh, the ransom. The ransom has also increased because what's a pirate got to do to make ends meet? And if they are less successful, they've got to charge more for each uh, individual ship that they get. Uh, if there were 31 ships and 800 people that were being held two years ago, Today, there are seven ships and 113 people. And I would personally attribute this almost all to private maritime security personnel. So we know that it's effective. Uh, what are the legal issues? We've encountered then some sort of legal problems because there's a lack of coherence in the international regulation of private maritime security in which you have <coughs> ships that might be flagged in one state and private maritime security that might come from another state. So you could have a ship that's flagged in South Korea, and it could have a crew from the Philippines and Sri Lanka, and you could have insur insurers uh, in London, multiple types of insurance. You have whole insurance and war risk insurance, liability insurance. So you have different insurers that would have to then, if there's a claim, try to uh, uh, seek to resolve who's going to pay that claim. And then you could have a private maritime security company out of Dubai, and the security team could be made up of nationals from, uh, from any countries that they happen to, to hire. There's really two major issues that have caused problems for international lawyers. And then, of course, there's a, in each country, there's a microcosm. There's a national uh, political and legal process that has taken place, not unlike the whole gun controversy that's sort of unfolding in the United States. Because in national laws, the regulation of private maritime security generally falls under the generic rules in the country for self-defense and for defense of others. So the two issues are carriage of firearms on board a ship. How does that work? And it's actually quite complex because it's regulated through international trafficking and arms regulations and national legislation. And also, it uh, affects the law of the sea. And then the, uh, the second issue is, what happens if the private maritime security persons use force and injure or kill a suspected pirate? And what, are the, what is the liability there? What rules apply? 
So the International Maritime Organization in London has attempted to work through these issues. The IMO is the specialized agency for maritime matters of the United Nations. It has 167 countries that are participants, and they meet periodically at the uh, IMO on the Thames River in London to work out issues for international shipping. And so this has come to the surface at the IMO. It was a, the issue was originally resisted by the international shipping community because they preferred not to have to deal with it or not to have to, to pay for what they thought ought to be the responsibility of governments. But finally, uh, even though the in international industry has opposed privately contracted armed security, um, most have relented. They've seen that it's effective. And so now the question is what sort of rules ought to be developed. Several sessions of the IMO began to sort of move slowly, as any international organization does, toward defining uh, proper roles for, for private maritime security. And then they have approached the International Standardization Organization, which uh, if you're not asleep now, now would be a good time to, <laughs> to go to sleep. Uh, the ISO, you may be familiar, particularly if you travel abroad and you see businesses that, that say ISO certified 2714, and you know, you know, all you know is that that's better than 2707, but you really don't know what that is. Uh, that's the international organization that works with the national organizations to develop standards for everything from bicycles to bike helmets to whatever. So if when you buy a bike helmet and it says ANSI certified, that's the American National Standards Institute. They represent the United States at the ISO. The ISO has taken up the thankless task of developing rules for private maritime security. But again, it's an international organization. So they have produced guidelines, which are available as of a month ago. But those guidelines tend to really beg the question or raise more questions than they answer. So there are guidelines that, that do provide some sort of uh, inclination on what direction we ought to go to with regard to carriage of firearms and the use of force. First with the carriage of firearms, uh, the guidelines say that the carriage of firearms ought to be in accord with the home state of the private security company as well as the flag state of, the, comp of the, sh the ship that they are going to be riding on. And there's not necessarily coherence in, in either of these two sets of laws. And so countries are scrambling to, de to develop relationships between the flag states and the private maritime security companies to try to harmonize those laws. Then it also says that when you carry armaments on board a ship that they ought to comply and have written authority from the flag state and then, where appropriate, the coastal state. And of course, that begs the question, when is it appropriate? Because under the law of the Sea Convention, we know that Article 19 affords all ships the right of innocent passage in the territorial sea. So as you converge traffic, you get into the territorial sea, which is out to 12 nautical miles from the shoreline. A nautical mile is slightly uh, longer than a statute mile. So any time that you converge in an area that's less than 24 nautical miles wide, such as the Strait of Hormuz or along the coast of Somalia as you enter the Gulf of Aden and the, the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb, <laughs> then you encounter the difficulty of having not just two states involved, the, the home state of the security company, the flag state of the ship, but now the coastal state. And coastal states have been inclined now to start to regulate the presence of onboard security. Under Article 19, uh, coastal states are entitled to regulate security that has some sort of, quote, disturbance of the peace on the coastal state. And coastal states have taken this as sort of a liberal uh, liberal reading and said, well, we don't like guns and therefore the presence of those weapons on board the state uh, is creating problems. Now, the second issue with regard to the use of force 
is, uh, is simply uh, as complicated because each of these states have different rules with regard to the use of force. So for example, in the United Kingdom, the use of force says that uh, much more circumspect than the United States, the use of force is that the use of force by an individual in self-defense or defense of others is not necessarily evidence of excessive use of force. So it's much, uh, a little more constrained than, than the United States. Egypt, on the other hand, says that the use of force, just like the U.S. and the U.K., has to be necessary and proportional in all the, all the typical language, but it doesn't have to be proportional in time. And that means that if somebody breaks into your house and then you eventually get the better of them and chase them into the yard, you can shoot them in the back, whereas in the United States that probably, or the United Kingdom, that probably would not be an option. So how is this, I'll conclude, I know I'm out of time, but um, how, how is this going to, uh, going to play out? It already has. Private security have used deadly force. They've killed pirates and there's not been any major or consequential legal follow-up. There will be. You may be familiar with the case of the Indian Marines, um, or the uh, Italian Marines on board the ship that was uh, off the coast of India, and they were arrested by India, and their case is now before the Supreme Court because they killed two Indian fishermen that they say they mistook for pirates. And it's a reasonable mistake because uh, fishermen tend to move to protect their nets and their, uh, that's their livelihood. And so they may be on a collision course and a ship might think, why else are, why, why are they not turning away and giving way to the larger vessel? And so mistakes like this are going to happen and when they happen, there are still not a set of coherent rules to try to resolve it. Well, we've traveled uh, through the Western Pacific and then the Indian Ocean, and we're now headed home. And uh, Professor uh, Somezi, tell us all about that. Thank you, Professor. Um, and I want to thank uh, General and Mrs. Dunlap for their gracious welcome and, and great hospitality. So thank you very much for having me and the whole LENS staff. Uh, it's been wonderful. Um, it's very interesting for me as the Coastie, and presumably the only Coastie in the room, um, to be sitting in between two naval officers, or former naval officers. And I thought to myself, well, reminded me of what uh, many of you in the room will ask, the Coast Guard, what is the Coast Guard? What is the Coast Guard? And Ronald Reagan remarked on 18 May 1988, said, people ask me all the time, what is the Coast Guard? And he looked in, in the eye and said, it's that hard nucleus about which the Navy forms in times of war. <laughs> so I, uh, with that, I'm delighted Coast to Guard's been telling the same joke for so long now. <laughs> that it's Since 88. Right. <laughs> um, interesting, the whole conference so far, I, I find it so fascinating. I think it's a theme that's running through and will continue the next day and a half is all of us as lawyers, as JAGs, as practitioners are catching up with a new type of warfare. Piracy, the lost, Gitmo, drones, cyber. We're catching up. The law is trying to catch up with modern 21st century warfare. Not always that well, as some will attest to what's going on in Guantanamo and other places, but other places quite well in how we've been uh, proceeding. But I think it's fascinating to watch that, and it's very timely to have this conference, because we do need to be the people that are generating ideas, like the Talon Manual and other items that help people to actually practice within the rule of law, and I think it's uh, to your credit, sir. Uh, what is the Coast Guard All Seriousness? We're one of the armed forces. Um, we're the only one with law enforcement authority both domestic and internationally recognized. And we have broad, broad law enforcement powers upheld by the courts consistently. And as the war on Al-Qaeda continues, you'll look to say we really are a hybrid. The war itself is a hybrid, and the Coast Guard is a mixture of warrior and law enforcement agent. And that's something I think that's been helpful to the Coast Guard and to the country as we've proceeded. We're really a unique component of the national security of the United States. When I say that the Coast Guard originally began, as you know, in 1790, Alexander Hamilton created the Coast Guard as, sec as Secretary of Treasury. When the Navy and Army was disbanded, they created the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard continued through and over through the years took on lighthouse service and took on it, it, uh, uh, iceberg patrol, 
oil pollution, and in 1915, we took on the life-saving service, and we became a humanitarian force as well, and stayed in the Department of Treasury until 1968, when President Johnson created the Department of Transportation. And we kind of, we were thrown in there. We said, we'll put something in there, they do buoys, we'll put the Coast Guard in there. <laughs> Literally. And we went in and we had an identity crisis. I mean, I have come from a Navy family and my family would kid with me and say, when you're done with your time in the Coast Guard, can you drive the buses in Manhattan? We're all part of transportation. It was just a weird place for us to be. And it's the reality. But the reality became, after the attacks of 9-11, we kind of returned to our roots. Uh, and the Department of Homeland Security has been a wonderful home for us. It's the right place for us to be. We're uh, very, very fortunate to be uh, welcomed by our DOD brethren and sisters. And it's a, it's a great, great fit for us. We appreciate it. And I think that's where we're at today, is a return kind of to our roots where Hamilton originally thought we should be in something like the Department of Homeland Security. So some people might ask, how are we, uh, what are these authorities? We have very, very broad domestic statutory authorities uh, ranging in, we're in Title 14, um, 14 U.S.C. 89, um, uh, Port and Waterway Secure S Safety Act, and other areas that we've had broad, tremendous domestic authority. And we are not bound by posse comitatus. So we're the one armed force that is not bound by uh, uh, posse comitatus. So domestically, we're quite broad and quite uh, privileged. Under international law, we're uh, fortunate to be practicing what's provided for in the lost, in the Law of the Sea Treaty. We, by custom, practice the international laws, things dealing with the contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, et cetera. So we have international authority through the lost by customary international law, declared by Reagan in 82. And domestically, we have tremendous support and authorities provided by the Congress. And as you listen today, I think the 21st century demands more and more Coast Guards. The force projection may not be as important as it has been in the past. What most countries and developing countries are looking forward and looking toward today are things basic to them, like fisheries, coastal security, piracy, and oil. Uh, they're looking for those. So what we have is a continuous request in the Coast Guard for our expertise in these areas through the State Department. It's consistent. Um, and it's particularly interesting that many of the places that are asking for our support and our knowledge and our laws and our authorities is in the developing world. The developing world, and that's where terror breeds, and that's where the terrorists reside. So if we can utilize the Coast Guard, this unique instrument of national security, to develop Coast Guards, which is really today's Navy, a 21st century Navy is the U.S. Coast Guard in many facets and parts around the world, we can help reduce some of this terrorist activity. Because many of these countries already have these authorities provided to them through the lost, and many are signatories, but they don't know how to exercise the authorities granted them. So we're helping develop those codes for them within their domestic authority, but internationally we have that. So some of these ports issues are really being exported to developing countries and really help us to have a safer, um, more peaceful planet. Um, when you look and you say, okay, we have these great authorities, Glenn, it's wonderful. And in terms of protecting the country, we are the last line of defense. The Coast Guard is the last line of defense. And the nation's done a great job, and the Department of Homeland Security has, with airports. Now, up until today, I presume we'll have TSA screeners everywhere. The cities are safer. We're much safer in airports than we were, regardless, whether it's because of TSA or whatever we are. We're safer. We're certainly paying more attention to potential calamities taking place. But I am convinced and remain convinced the next attack, the easiest prey, are the ports of the United States. And we're not protected. We're not. Um, we need really more emphasis placed on our last line of defense or our ports. We need to really focus on how to do that, not just providing the authorities, but actually providing resources and people and money. Because when you think about it, and you take a look at the great United States, we're uh, we contain 3.36 million miles of water, 95,000 square miles of coastline. 95% of foreign trade is through our ports, 95%, estimated to be $1 trillion a year. If you're a terrorist and you're looking at that, you're saying that has a major impact. Again, the MO of Al-Qaeda 1.0 was major attacks. We're thinking 2.0 is smaller, more isolated attacks and, and disruption of uh, re regional areas, but I think that they are looking at this, and we know they're monitoring this, and we are vulnerable. 
It's just a reality. The United States is vulnerable at our ports. And why do I say that? Although we have great authorities, the Coast Guard, the people in charge of your ports and guarding the coast and the coastline, has 40,000 men and women, as of today, probably less. That's the same as the amount of New York City police officers. I go back again, 95,000 square miles of coastline and the same number of Coast Guard men and women as the New York City Police Department. That has to change. The world is changing. We have to adapt and recognize that we need more resources and more money going to the Coast Guard to help us. Again, post 9-11, the Congress has been right with us, has been strongly supportive, have given the captains of the port in these ports enormous broad authorities, some extending onto the land, actually. And we've placed Coast Guard officers overseas because one of the worst things we were doing was allowing the shipping, we can't wait to inspect a cargo unit after it's already hit the port of Baltimore or port of Los Angeles and explodes. We're trying to hit them in the ports of embarkation. So we actually have Coast Guard officers overseas in ports before the containers go onto the vessels, inspecting them to ensure there isn't any sort of problems uh, with them. And that's really through uh, the great work of the State Department allowing us to have that opportunities. We require vessels now coming in to have 96 hours, 96 hours notice of arrival so that we have extra time to prepare and actually monitor who they're from, where they're from, what they have on board, and who's sailing the vessel and who's supporting them. And I think uh, very importantly, we also changed from the idea of first responders. Um, we've really worked with our local partners, which you have to do in port security. It can't be just the Coast Guard. It has to be the state DEPs, environmental protection. It has to be the FBI. It has to be U.S. Attorney's Office. It has to be the Navy. Is, um, rather than first responders, we don't want that. We want to have first preventers. And that's kind of a theme that we've put forth in the ports is to say, first responder, it's too late. That means we're responding to the attacks that already occurred. A first preventer is much more important and much more necessary to protect the nation, and protect the coastlines. So we've done that as, as well. Again, when you look at this, you say, the Coast Guard needs more people and resources to fulfill its obligations. There's no question. We do. And it's hard to say that to you today when we know sequesters in and people being furloughed. And, but that's just the reality. We have to start mirroring up like we are having the law catch up to the 21st century. Our congressional actions and our resources and support and maybe emphasis has to be placed more on not the best offense, is the, uh, the best defense is a good offense, but perhaps the best defense is a good defense. And that might be the change that we have to look at um, as the rest of the world is increasing their emphasis on creating coast guards, on creating armed coast guards, on creating these small vessels that can intercept people and not necessarily force projection navies. Um, we, we really can't afford not to support this idea of increasing the abilities, resources, and uh, people associated with the Coast Guard. So interestingly, I wanted to put out one th other thing while we're talking about ports and, and the needs for that. And what we've done is, again, we've increased our statutory authority after 9-11, but necessarily nothing came with it, unfunded mandates. The latest and greatest one, which is not necessarily a port issue, but it's of great interest to all of us in, in the services, is the Arctic, the wild, wild west. Who does Congress and the President turn to to help out Shell Oil in the Arctic? The Coast Guard. Again, so we take on another mission area. We're having, we don't have icebreakers uh, even funded in the next budget cycle to fulfill these obligations. But we're sending up buoy tenders and other folks to guard Shell Oil. You just saw recently Shell just pulled out or is planning on stopping their exploration in, in the region. But that's not going to change over time. Really, the Arctic is the wild, wild west right now. And we need to provide emphasis and resources in that area as much as possible. But it's tough for us to do that with limited resources, limited uh, abilities. Um, you have, what are we talking about in the Arctic? What are we concerned about? We're drilling underneath the cap, ice cap. Oil spills, what do we do? We've seen the problems of dealing with oil spills in different areas of the country. Picture underneath the ice cap, the damage would be astronomical. We're trying to catch up to that, like the law is, we're operationally trying to catch up to find best ways to prevent those sort of calamities. There's also security needs. We have to deal with that, and we're uh, actually putting out a document on the Arctic and our efforts in the Arctic in the next uh, couple of months, the Coast Guard will be. Because beyond security, ice breaking, oil spills, we also have to be concerned about the indigenous persons that are living there. How are we dealing with them? Are we just going to uproot them? How are they feeling about this new change of lifestyle? And we're very conscious and sensitive to those issues as well. So I just wanted to end with the idea again, Congress has given the Coast Guard for port security tremendous authorities. 
but no resources and people to support those efforts. And that's something that I would think we should start beginning to think 21st century warfare might require the best defense is a good defense and to bolster our ports and bolster our security here at home, whether that's with the Navy and the Coast Guard or just the Coast Guard alone. Thank you. Well, we've taken our little tour around the world and we're now in port and uh, we now turn it over to you for questions. Sir, please direct your question if you have it to one of our speakers. I shall. David Litt, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Um, this is for Captain Sulmezi, um, trying to wrestle with some of the um, legal issues, law issues uh, in the work that, that you are doing. Uh, what struck me as interesting is the, um, the uh, arrangements that have been made at foreign ports to have these um, extraterritorial, I guess, inspections. What are some of the legal issues involved that I guess State Department has been uh, uh, working with, the, uh, with those states and has Mexico, for example, ever tried to ask us to inspect ships in San Diego to prevent arms from coming around into Mexico? Uh, there's certainly a lot of going back and forth between the two and a lot of it has to do with the, uh, the, uh, the other countries' own domestic authorities and their statutes. And also a lot of it is less legal and much more political and policy related to have U.S inspectors inspecting cargo in a foreign country before it comes to the United States. And again, there was much more support for it through the good offices of the State Department right after 9-11. I would suggest now it's not as strong and perhaps not as uh, supportive as it has been. But it's really trying to marry up. Um, there was a sense from most people, and I think most people in the room would agree after 9-11 that we needed to do this sort of uh, activity to prevent uh, cat catastrophe occurring in the ports. Um, there has been significant support. Um, it has eroded slightly. And to the second part of your question, has Mexico asked us? They, right. Um, they have, I think there's some interest in that, but I think the United States box at such uh, uh, opportunity, shall we say. Thank you. Next question. Sir. I'm uh, Brian Hayes with the Norfolk Field Office of the FBI. Uh, my question is for Commander Kraska. We had the, uh, the trial wrap up in Norfolk last week uh, for the pirate to attack the USS Ashland in 2010. Uh, a number of the witnesses in that trial were US Navy officers, surface warfare officers, and it was, it was clear that they were very well prepared and trained to defend the USS Ashland, and they were not very well prepared through no fault of their own to testify in federal court and be cross-examined by, uh, by very, very good defense attorneys. Uh, fortunately, the, the case uh, ended in a successful conclusion. But uh, is the Navy uh, preparing for future criminal cases against pirates who are seized? And if so, what, what training uh, and what techniques is the Navy implementing to facilitate that? Thank you uh, very much for the question. Beginning with uh, the, the attack on the Seaborne Spirit in 2005, that was a, a, a luxury cruise ship that was uh, taking an idyllic cruise from Yemen to Mombasa. Uh, <laughs> there were American citizens on board, and so suddenly the FBI and the Naval Criminal Investigative Service became very interested in piracy, and piracy uh, really started to, to increase as a result, we immediately saw the problem that once we interdict the pirates and have immediate control over them, that there's an issue of what to do with them and how and what's the end game. And the end game is a successful prosecution. There's a lot of political issues involved, uh, including with Department of State, as in working with other countries to sort of spread the uh, the burden around. Um, but the United States ultimately began to prosecute some pirates when they had attacked uh, U.S. ships, like the Ashland, which was mistaken for a commercial vessel and attacked. This was a warship that was attacked. Uh, uh, wrong, they picked the wrong target. Um, so, but we did, uh, actually it came out of the Joint Staff and it's uh, an interagency uh, product to develop what are called disposition and logistics guidance for the commanding officers of the ship and the crew to uh, be able to think about handling evidence, how to market, how to secure it, uh, and 
take the case through to prosecution wherever that is. The, the problem is, is there, are, there are different standards in different jurisdictions, um, so we continually improve the disposition and logistics guidance. Uh, and in fact, a, a, a new version of it, it's a for, for official use only, but it came out recently as we continue to learn um, how, to, how to do that. I'm, it, it's not good to hear that your view is that, the, that they were not well prepared. They should have been uh, better prepared. Uh, the Navy personnel are not law enforcement personnel, but nonetheless, um, they can address threats at sea, and so some of these have um, law enforcement implications. The best thing is for us to get pirates in the hands of uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Service or U.S. Marshals or FBI as quickly as we can, and so that's, uh, that's what we've done. There are protocols that exist, so you know these are not professional uh, people that are that are accustomed to being in, in court, and so uh, you know maybe that would that would just be the the, the difficulty there. Next question, sir. Mike Anderberg, <coughs> retired Air Force. Uh, Admiral Howe, what is the effect of rising sea levels on disputes having to do with rocks and low-lying islands? <laughs> they go away. <laughs> yeah, it makes it easier because, as George has pointed out, they just, they go away. <laughs> they just disappear. Um, you know, I think the threshold question be, before you, you even get to the, the natural question of rising sea levels really is, uh, can we come to a point where we all agree on exactly what the parameters are of a rock and an island? Uh, the, the Law of the Sea Convention uh, made an attempt to do that, and, uh, but ingenious people being ingenious, uh, that some of the parties in the region, for example, have taken to uh, building, well, for example, uh, one of the criteria for an island under the Law of the Sea Convention as it be capable of sustaining habitation. And it's important to be an island under the Law of the Sea Convention because if you're an island, then you get a 200 uh, nautical mile uh, exclusive economic zone. And a lot of things that flow with being called an island. So you want to be an island if you're a piece of ground sitting out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, but to be an island, you have to be capable of sustaining habitation. So. What uh, some of the countries in the region have taken to doing is, for example, uh, building platforms that are attached to reefs that the reefs are submerged uh, most of the time, if not all the time, but the platform is above the water. And now they're building, beginning to build primitive sewage systems on these platforms. Uh, and, and it's amazing where you can live if your government wants you to live there badly enough. <laughs> and so, uh, we, we have these efforts to demonstrate that, hey, we're sustaining habitation right here, and so it's an island, it belongs to us, and therefore we get all the rights that flow from it. Um, I, I think that if sea levels rise, uh, it would, in, in theory anyway, it could, it, all joking aside, it, it might change the character of some of these uh, places. There is a moot court problem right now for law stu students right now this uh, semester that gets to that very issue, an entire island nation disappears because of rising sea levels and a lot of questions that flow from that. But uh, I mean, I, I think that, yes, it could change the dyna dynamic. That's it. Um, give it to the student over there. Oh, sorry. Am I next? OK. If, um, if, if you could pass it to the, to the young lady over there. <laughs> You're after that. You're after that. <laughs> um, I'm Arielle Friedman Sanchez, a second year student here at Duke Law. Um, and Commander Krasa, I was wondering, um, do you feel that the release of the new ISO standard replaces other efforts to standardize the law um, regarding uh, private security on <laughs> vessels, um, including like the Series 100 rules? I know that BIMCO pulled their support um, from that that effort in January, um, and are there other efforts to standardize the law in this area? Uh, 
There were efforts uh, with the IMO. Uh, the IMO provided guidance to some extent for both ship owners and ship operators as well as recommendations to governments. And those <coughs> guidelines and recommendations went to the ISO and the plan is for the IMO to adopt the ISO uh, work, uh, the, the standards. The problem is, is that they're okay as far as they go. And so there's a lot of work to be done. There are not other efforts. In, in particular, I, I, I know you won't, but other people should not mistake uh, the efforts of regulating uh, private security on the battlefield with uh, mixing that with regulation of private security in the peacetime endeavor of shipboard security. So there's not, uh, there, there is one other effort, I guess, that's sort of what we term soft law, I guess, for, for uh, another uh, term, and that's uh, the, the SAMI guidelines of, the, uh, of industry itself, where industry has said we are going to, uh, industry consortium has said we're going to take certain steps to uh, ensure that we have professionals that are operating on board ships. There's nothing else at the international governance level that's, uh, that's working on the issue. So all of the eggs are all in the basket of the ISO, and I expect that the ISO, these are uh, uh, preliminary guidelines. I expect that they will um, develop and hopefully broaden and deepen over time. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Bob Lynch. I'm one of the few members of my family who is uh, not lawyers or not military. I'm just a retired person here without an agenda. Just walked in, and, uh, but uh, I guess it's Captain uh, Sulmacy, the Coast Guard. I agree a hundred percent with your concerns and your fears of port security. I think it was around 2008. It was an issue for a few months in the general media about port security. This LNG tanker was uh, was going into Boston Harbor. Is a Yemeni flagged, and it port faded away. No one's talking. This is the first I've heard of it in a long time. I think since, you know, it's been 11 and a half years since 9-11, uh, real complacency has set in. You know, I feel on the radio this morning coming in, uh, they're joking about, well, the traffic lights are working, sequester. I see that same attitude is setting in, and um, the sequester's going to be a field day for the late night comedians. But um, I guess the question I have for you, anything short of another attack you think would get get what we want, more security, more funding? I wouldn't want to say that. Thank you for the question. I wouldn't want to say that, but I, um, you're not sure what would prompt uh, people to provide resources. We've been struggling with this since uh, the Coast Guard was created, so it's uh, always been a constant struggle, but it's become more and more important to have us up to speed and more better equipped and better resourced. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, unfortunately, your uh, hypothesis might be correct, and I wouldn't want to say that officially, but certainly a concern would be if it does take something like that to occur. It's like anything, it's a soft spot. It's a soft hit. That's the reality. If you're looking at conducting a terrorist action against the United States, and I'm telling you what I'm telling you, that's what I'd hit if I were them. And I think people would react certainly after that. But we are going back to your question. As a result of today and the next few months, we will go back to pre-9-11 levels. We just got up to a certain, we'll go back to pre-9-11 levels and staffing for the Coast Guard. And while we're being asked to do the Arctic mission, we're not being funded for icebreakers to do it. Uh, my, my name is Mark Tempest. I'm a retired Navy captain and a lawyer. But, uh, my question is for Commander Kraska, which has to do with, I want to talk a little bit about West Africa, the Gulf of Guinea piracy, and what steps AFRICOM or the Africa Station is undertaking, if you know in that area. Maybe Admiral, you know. Well, West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea is considered sort of the next shoe to drop uh, because of all of the offshore oil infrastructure. It's a very different uh, business model shall we say, for piracy in, off the coast of West Africa. It's primarily uh, uh, fuel theft and fuel smuggling. Uh, there is now starting to be some kidnapping for ransom because th they're looking across the continent and seeing that that's been fairly lucrative for Somali 
pirates. Uh, there, there are some other differences. There's more organization and more capability in West Africa, uh, partly private industry because of the oil industry that's there, but also the governments have been working together longer. Uh, so the model that everybody holds up is in Asia, with regard, primarily funded by Japanese money to develop. Uh, there's a treaty, the RECAP treaty, that uh, involves four, actually now 16 countries uh, that cooperate and they operate an information sharing center to try to uh, coordinate and deconflict their efforts. That has been imported into East Africa, but it's uh, been having to be imported wholesale. That is, that there's essentially, there was no capability at all. And the, the information sharing center, there's three of them in East Africa. The last one has just come online. West Africa was already ahead of the game in that respect because of Malka. The, uh, the Maritime Organization of West and Central Africa, which has uh, more than 20 countries. And it, that organization had atrophied somewhat. Uh, it's fairly old, 30 years or so. Uh, but in the last five or six years, it's been uh, resurrected. And so that's what I would say is that they're, they're still ahead of the game. The problem is not as great in West Africa, and they have greater uh, resources and organization to be able to, to address it. Question over here. Hi, uh, Mark Nance and Commander Kraska. Nice to meet you uh, in person, actually. Um, uh, but I had a couple of comments. One is I, I'm curious whether talking about international standards, I'm sorry, from North Carolina State University. The, um, whether Interpol, Interpol has started to develop standards specifically addressing the gentleman from the FBI's uh, concerns about what counts as legitimate evidence for piracy, uh, for maritime piracy. And I'm just wondering, either from the FBI's perspective or from the, the Navy's perspective, uh, whether the US government is cooperating in the, the establishment of the development of those standards or whether we're sort of unaware of that or not participating in it. Um, and then the other to the viability of the private security uh, contracting solution to, to maritime piracy in general, whether you know the next the next generation of ships, the you know the the profit margin on shipping is just razor thin, and that's expected to go down. And of course, there are real problems with the increased costs of private security contractors that come along with that as well. And it doesn't seem it doesn't seem viable to me. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. The the efforts at Interpol are again focused on a different set of issues. Uh, with regard to prosecution. And so there are efforts underway, both bilateral and multilateral, for evidence collection, but not with regard to uh, private maritime security. This is, you're talking about uh, in the context of governments pro bringing pirates in court and then uh, developing, trying to develop uniform standards for prosecution. There's been some work on that with bilateral agreements between uh, uh, countries in East Africa and, for example, the European Union or the United States. Um, but it's a different set of issues than the regulation of private uh, maritime security companies. Let me make a general comment uh, about uh, all of these topics. And one of these is a huge complexity we've got. For example, at the, in the United States, you can't, you'd have no federal common law crimes, which means that whatever Congress enacts, the courts can hear. If they haven't enacted anything, courts can't hear it. I think the second problem is, is the, what's been touched upon, the profit line. And the more regulation you put into a port, the price goes up for the, the private enterprise. And then you have, of course, the whole issue of, uh, you know, on a world scale basis, who owns the ships? And if, for instance, in the United States, we now have in Title 46 a, an absolute defense uh, of self-defense uh, for any vessel of the United States, which is very broadly defined in the code and therefore would authorize it in terms of civil liability, I think, and probably criminal liability if the master employs the, uh, you know, the gun toters. But you've also got the problem, frankly, at the international level, of, uh, well, suppose they engage in a shootout and they start going after these folks as they leave the ports of these coastal uh, states. And then there's a the problem, I think, in Nigeria of river piracy. And that conjures up a whole new round of issues besides the private problems of the oil industry and the like. 
So I think those are just, in other words, it's, a, it's much more complicated even than we've been able to express it in these few moments. Any other questions, comments? Sir, I've got one, sir. General. Well, that was a terrific uh, update. Um, Commander Trasco, uh, last time I was into this topic, can, can people hear me? Uh, can, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> terrific update, even for the sea services. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it was just terrific. Absolutely terrific. Um, the, um, the, is there a moral hazard with insurers not wanting armed commercial vessels? So, you know, it would seem to be, it's intuitive that they wouldn't want heavily armed vessels. They'd like to have the piracy, piracy action happen and then, you know, have it get over with and without destruction of what's been insured. And does that create uh, bad incentives, perverse incentives with regard to the, the legal rules we have, the international security policy, our diplomacy. I, if it does, you know, where are those points of friction with the law, with, with other notions of, uh, of justice and fairness and how this plays out? Um, and, or is it, uh, is it just dominated by the, the money, to go to the professor's point about the, uh, the uh, monetary aspects? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, well, I guess uh, my view would be that industry has been relatively supportive of privately contracted armed security. In fact, uh, demonstrating that you have a, uh, a certified serious team on board a ship has driven down insurance rates, which had skyrocketed. That's part of the 13 to $15 billion uh, uh, effect on the global economy. So, so far, there's, you know, there's some... Uh, some cost savings or some value. Uh, there's not been one ship that has had private security on board or arm or government security for that matter. There's not been one ship with armed security on board that has been mm. successfully hijacked. And so that's been the case several years ago, and it continues to be the case. And as a result, that's that's why uh, industry has slowly come around to embrace it, and uh, the insurers also stand to benefit because they have to uh, figure out which insurance company is going to pay a claim, and the claims are not, you know, they're going up, they're not small. So uh, that's actually, so that's a new data point for me, not, not having, you know, looked at this in a while. So you're saying that the industry is coming around. Barclays and these other big insurers are comfortable, now, increasingly comfortable with armed commercial vessels as long yes, as that's sir. professionally done and... Yes, sir. What regulated with professionals doing it? Yes, sir. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Sir. Uh, there was a, a case going on now. Could you identify yourself, please? Sorry. Yes, sir. There was a case going on, I think it's still going on, that uh, somebody uh, in the U.S. is suing Shell Oil for its activities in Nigeria, saying that they helped the government, the Nigerian government, uh, kill some of their relatives or something like that. Are you familiar with that one? Vaguely. Yeah, uh, Professor Walker commented vaguely, and, and I would say the same thing, but my guess is what we've got here is some version of the alien tort statute uh, where uh, this, the suit is against Shell in tort and trying to obtain liability that way through U.S. law. I, can you yeah. illuminate it? Well, the yeah. only thing I can say is that issue, I think, may be up and may be decided by the Supreme Court sometime this term. It's up there right now, and how they're going to do, I have not followed the oral argument on it. But, uh, but that I, issue I think this is, is the Kiobel right. yeah. case. That's the one. Yeah. And I would add that the world expert in that area is uh, Professor Curtis Bradley uh, at uh, Duke Law School. And who gave a lecture yesterday as part of our prequel to the conference on this very subject. I wish I could repeat it, but I'm not Curtis Bradley, I can assure you. Uh, could I pose a question, uh, Admiral Houck? We've talked about the South China Sea and how nations are turning rocks into islands and so forth. Are we seeing this phenomenon any other places in the world, or should we, we be watching for it? And do you think that the U.S. has formulated, you know, the right approach or right policy to that? Well, I think the U.S. is, is somewhat, somewhat disadvantaged because of our, our failure to join the Law of the Sea Convention. And the, there is, uh, 
there's an extent to which, and it's, it's not a complete extent, but there's an extent to which when we attempt to uh, define terms in the treaty uh, that we do run into some resistance that way for not having uh, membership in the convention. Uh, in terms of other places where the, the phenomenon may be coming up, um, I don't know if anybody else can, can contribute any other places like that where the rocks and islands phenomenon is so uh, predominant. We ran into a definitional issue when I did this little book on definitions of the law of the sea and finally came up with the only thing I could do is say, go look at the book. We'll do it for the dominant area. I, I think the... I mean, I think the, the interesting, I mean, frankly, the interesting phenomenon for me in a, converse, in, in a group like this, in a conversation like this, is that there has, has been, uh, there have been no questions or perhaps less interest that may or may not be the right read of, of the group uh, in the overall question of ratification of the, the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, and it, it is, it, it's plays and it's an issue in the Western Pacific. Uh, it is a uh, arguably very important proposition in the Arctic uh, and as well has the potential on this again here, here on Sequester Day to give the U.S. the opportunity for a dramatic extension of the U.S. continental shelf. Uh, and so uh, Senator Kerry held hearings on the issue last summer. Uh, there was some opposition expressed, but I think a, a wide swath of support for the convention from very strange bedfellows, uh, industry, environmental groups, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense and the Coast Guard. And uh, it is one of those issues, I think, that's sort of lurking under the radar that given the, the uh, partisanship in Congress right now, it may be difficult for it to get traction. But it is an issue, I think, that people should continue to maintain a focus on from a maritime standpoint. If, if I could, that was uh, it's interesting, Admiral, too, because in 2004, I believe, it was voted out of the Foreign Relations Committee 19-0 in favor of ratification. It stalled when it got to uh, the U.S. Senate. This is in 2004. And so this has continued now. And this summer, there was thought to be quite a, it was quite a push from the State Department. and. Uh, was looking again possible, but it seemed awkward. And I've spoken to John Bellinger about this during a presidential election. Um, it seemed to be that got caught up in the presidential politics and 36 senators came out against it, even though President Bush, President Obama, Secretary Rice, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton all supported ratification of the Law of the Sea Treaty. It's very, very peculiar. Someone was asking during the break, how does this happen? I mean, why are we at sequester now? <laughs> it's about the same reason. Well, maybe in the, in the last few minutes, you could give a, a little bit of an outline of what the objections are. And I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but it seems to have something to do with this fear that this body is going to adjudicate uh, mineral claims and so forth. But do you know what the source of the opposition is? There is, uh, and probably worth, before getting to the opposition, sort of just outlining the, the potential incredible expansion of, of U.S. opportunity to have sovereignty over mineral resources. Um, but I think the source of the opposition uh, largely uh, is derived from the fact that there is a concern that uh, the United States can do things unilaterally that, and it doesn't need the convention support to do them, such that uh, if someone talks about the resources in the extended continental shelf, and, and I realize some of this is our terms of art that would be if we had more time, we could spend more time defining them. But uh, there is a potential area beyond 200 miles of the United States, uh, which has uh, extraordinary potential resources in it. If the United States were a member of the convention, the United States could get a claim, a uh, scientifically based claim, to this extended continental shelf ratified, and then under international law have secure title to the area. Uh, opponents, I, I think, make what I believe to be a flawed argument that we, we don't need any of that international law stuff. We can just go out there and do it. And, uh, and for reasons beyond the scope of this conversation, that's flawed. I think they also make the argument frequently about United Nations taxes, that we would have to pay uh, royalties under uh, part of the, the plan. This is a plan the United States developed, actually. Uh, where if we mine from the deep seabed, then a certain small percentage of the profits of that would go back into an international organization, which the, UN, with, which the U.S. would be a member of and have veto power over the distribution of those resources. But 
the bumper sticker UN taxes has caught hold in, in some quarters and uh, has made it difficult. And, and that money, I think, was intended to go to landlocked countries that, so that they would have some benefit from, from the minerals. Yes, sir. And I, I think if, if I could, Admiral, um, General, at 82, when, when President Reagan, we, we didn't ratify the UNCLOS then, and he declared his customary international law, mostly with, except for the deep seabed mining provisions, which the Admiral's alluding to. And once that was updated in 1994, it went back to the Senate and, and was strong opposition from conservative elements, some from within the state, um, who were in charge of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time. Um, one senator in particular. And it, it uh, so that was a, a hold up. But what's gone on over time, and I understand what the Admiral's saying, what I sense, and the General says, what's the opposite? The opposition now is some is a little more nuanced, I think, or the tertiary one uh, is that why do we have to? If there is a seeding of sovereignty of some sort, and there is some, if there is some seeding of sovereignty, then if we're already adhering to it by custom, the Coast Guard, I teach the cadets, we're abiding by it. We enforce it under international law, those provisions. What's the upside? And then it becomes, here's someone like an Ambassador Bolton, interestingly, who condemned customary international law in the war on Al-Qaeda, but now is saying it should be just customary international law in the Law of the Sea Treaty in several op-eds during the summer. Um, I think it becomes something that's a little bit more nuanced than what really becomes the issue in the end is it's politics. The president wasn't ready to put this up front for a vote, wasn't ready to push all the way for a vote during the summer, during the presidential election. And it seems to be pretty fair and simple. That's the bottom line. He wants the two major objectives. He doesn't want to get into any 36 senators voting against him. He's got to really put through the health care reform, and now it's immigration reform. Those are the two biggies. Anything that might detract from that unnecessarily, I think he's shying away from, since we're already adhering to it by custom anyway. Professor Walker will close our, close our session here. Point, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Robbie Robertson, now Emeritus at Duke, has an excellent book chapter in one of the War College Blue Books that you might want to look at. The United States, under the Johnson administration, began the notion of the common heritage, and it was then passed on to somebody else and so forth. So it's part of our own uh, doing. And number two is the fact that two-thirds of the world is civil law in nature, and they look to things like treaties and statutes and not to customary law and common law as we in the United States and Britain and a few other places like Canada do. And I think that to have the treaty means that you've now got two sources of international law that you can invoke, most of which are exactly the same. Uh, and as I've been on record elsewhere, uh, that's why we need to ratify this thing. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the panel. You know, one of the things, themes of this conference is the new face of national security law. And I, you know, we're actually talking about things as, 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 uh, as Admiral Howe illuminated to us go back centuries and centuries and centuries. But a lot of times when we think of national security law, uh, we, don't we don't always appreciate this w wider aperture that we need to take a look at, especially the impact in the 21st century of national security issues on commerce. And I think this, this panel really, really demonstrated that. I, I think we all owe them a, a big hand. And now I'm going to ask you to execute an operation with military precision. You will have exactly 14 minutes to go out, get your box lunch, come back in for our truly authentic working lunch. We are privileged to have uh, General Mark Martin's here with us, and he's going to be our, our lunch and com conversation person.